Thank you very much. That concludes topical questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I take this opportunity to welcome Richard Leonard to his post? Despite the differences between our two parties, I believe that leadership is a privilege and it can also be a joy, so I wish him well. Um, and moving to substantive matters, can I... Can I ask the First Minister, is her Scottish growth scheme a con? First Minister. Well, firstly, let me also take the opportunity to congratulate Richard Leonard on his election as leader of Labour in Scotland and welcome him to his place today. I look forward to our exchanges uh, taking place in just a few minutes uh, time. The Scottish growth scheme, as Ruth Davidson is uh, aware, was established uh, or the announcement of it was made last year and the programme for government work has been done to establish that since uh, and through the different strands of the Scottish growth scheme uh, we intend to see companies supported uh, in the very near future. Of course we want to go further. We have now announced an intention to establish a Scottish National Investment Bank to provide long-term patient capital for Scottish businesses and support the strategic development of the Scottish economy, something I would hope members right across the chamber would support. Ruth Davidson. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but the reason I asked it, Presiding Officer, was because in a parliamentary answer a few weeks ago, the Scottish Government confirmed that the first £50 million of this fund will come from the financial transactions budget. Now that's a method of funding that was yesterday described by the Finance Secretary Derek Mackay as a con. But of course, when the First Minister announced her big Scottish growth scheme last year, she used quite different languages. She said, this is a half billion pound vote of confidence in Scottish business, Scottish workers and the Scottish economy. Now, like everyone else in this chamber, I would welcome half a billion pound investment in the Scottish economy uh, if any pennies of it were ever to appear quite soon. But I'm just curious as to whether the First Minister can explain why when the Scottish Government uses this method to invest in Scotland, it's a vote of confidence, but when the UK Government does it, it's a con. Well, First Minister. Let me explain exactly why the Chancellor of the Exchequer's announcement in the budget yesterday uh, is accurately described as a con, because I was watching, he stood up and he said, without qualification, that his budget would deliver an extra £2 billion for Scotland. Here's what the Fraser of Allender Institute said uh, yesterday about the £1.1 billion of that that is in the form of financial transactions. It cannot be used to support day-to-day -day spending yeah. on public yeah. services. Oh. So the Chancellor tried to give the impression yeah. that this was somehow yeah. a big boost to our health service, our education, system to public services, the length and breadth of the country. But as Ruth Davidson knows, that is far from the truth. In fact, the reality following the budget uh, yesterday is this, again confirmed by the Fraser of Allender Institute. Scotland is facing a real terms cut in our day-to-day -day budget next year of more than £200 million, more than £500 million over the next two years. Now, presenting officer, if Ruth Davidson is prepared to stand up in this chamber today and somehow argue that that is a good deal for Scotland, then Ruth Davidson is even more of a party stooge for our Westminster masters than I thought she was. Ruth Davidson. President officer, we usually hear from the SNP that they're not getting enough money. Today, we've got a brand new one. It's the wrong kind of money they're being given. <laughs> Money that can be spent on housing, no thank you. Money to tackle fuel poverty, how dare the UK government. Only this First Minister could be handed an extra £2 billion in spending power and still sound like somebody has stolen her scone. <laughs> Shouldn't the First Minister spend a little less time complaining about where the money is coming from and a bit more time thinking of the positive things that she can do with it? Yeah. First Minister. Well, if I was... If I was a, a Tory these days, I wouldn't be standing up here talking about scones, given the number of Scottish families being forced to food banks because of the policies of this Tory government. But here's, here's another fact about the so-called largesse towards Scotland of the Chancellor. Not only can these financial transactions, in the words of the Fraser of Allender Institute, not be spent on day-to-day -day spending on public services, this money also has to be repaid yeah. by the Scottish yeah. Government yeah. to 
the UK government. So let's just cut to the chase. I know that Ruth Davidson desperately wants to somehow pretend that yesterday's budget was a great deal for Scotland. But let me go back to the central point here. And this is the central point. This is the central point that Ruth Davidson really has to address. And I would invite her to do so after the budget yesterday. And even if everything Ruth Davidson is saying about the budget yesterday is true, after all of that is taken into account, the resource day-to-day -day spending budget of this government next year will be £200 million less in real terms. So I invite Ruth Davidson to stand up here when she next gets her feet and tell us where does she think we should take that £200 million from? The health service, education, or if not these things, where does Ruth Davidson think that these Tory cuts should be taken from? Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, the First Minister is standing there telling us that she's being shortchanged. But some of us think that an extra £2 billion, more than she woke up with yesterday morning, is quite a bit of extra change to have. That money is available now for the Scottish Government ahead of its budget next month. And she faces a test. At the election, we promised to raise the minimum wage and to increase the personal allowance so that we didn't take that increase back in tax. Yesterday, that promise was delivered. Yep. The SNP promised to protect the basic rate of income tax, and they're now preparing to hike it up. So isn't that the difference between us? When it comes to tax, we keep our promises to Scotland workers, and she breaks hers. First Minister. Well, Ruth Davidson doesn't want to take my word uh, for what the budget yesterday means for public spending in Scotland. So I am right now going to read out word for word uh, from the blog published yesterday by the Fraser of Allender Institute. And I assume nobody uh, across this chamber will question uh, these findings. What it says, and I quote, the resource block grant, that's the Scottish Government resource block grant, remains on track to fall in real terms over the next two years. By 2019-20, the resource block grant will be around £500 million lower than in 17-18. That's over the next two years, £500 million being cut from Scotland's budget by the Tories. And Ruth Davidson has got the nerve to stand up here and try to tell us that the Tories are doing us some kind of favour. So as we conclude uh, our deliberations over our budget over the next few weeks, uh, we will be considering how we protect our public services in the face of those cuts, how we protect vulnerable families, uh, so many of whom are being forced into poverty and to food banks by this Tory government, and how we continue to make investments in the infrastructure and support that our businesses need to thrive and to grow the economy. We will take decisions that are in the interests of the people of Scotland, while the Tories continue to impose cuts on the people of Scotland. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, <laughs> presiding officer, uh, this morning I had the honour of addressing a rally of firefighters from right across Scotland who are lobbying this parliament today. These courageous women and men put their lives on the line to keep the rest of us safe. But since Scotland's fire and rescue service was centralised, these heroic firefighters have seen over 700 frontline jobs axed. They have watched their pay being cut in real terms, year upon year. They see a service in decline. Will the First Minister explain why on her watch, Scotland's fire and rescue service has been cut? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I, can I also take the opportunity to pay tribute to our firefighters? They do a fantastic job day in and day out and as Richard Leonard rightly says regularly put their lives on the line uh, in the interest of the safety of all of us. Uh, let me just address uh, the issues that Richard Leonard has raised and they are important issues uh, but it's because they're important that this government has increased the operational budget for the fire and rescue service in this financial year by 21.7 million pounds to support investment in equipment and uh, resources. Of course, uh, as a result of the budget yesterday and after uh, years of pressure by those of us on this side uh, of the House, £10 million pounds next year uh, will be able to be reclaimed by the fire service in VAT and they will benefit from the, the whole of that additional 
£10 million. Uh, since reform of the fire service, there have been no compulsory redundancies and no station closures. 100 additional firefighters were recruited in January of this year and a recruitment campaign for 300 additional firefighters will be launched next week. So our focus has been and will continue to be on protecting frontline services. And on the issue of pay, pay negotiations uh, in terms of the fire and rescue service, as Richard Leonard will be aware, uh, are ongoing. In terms of the next financial year, of course, uh, this government uh, to this day remains the only government in the whole of the UK, and here, of course, I include the Labour government in Wales. We are the only government in the UK that has given an unequivocal commitment to lift the 1% public sector pay cap, uh, and I think it is deeply regrettable that no other government, including the Labour government in Wales, has yet agreed to do likewise. <clears throat> Richard Leonard. Well, the poster of the uh, Fire Brigades Union in Scotland uh, made it clear, no more cuts. So the people of Scotland will have to make up their mind about who they believe. The firefighters on the front line or the first minister on the sideline. Presiding officer, <laughs> under my leadership, under my leadership, the Scottish Labour Party will work with the government and the trade unions to try and claw back the millions of pounds that have been lost. But that in itself will not be enough. So will the First Minister guarantee no more cuts to the Fire and Rescue Service? First Minister. I've, I've, just, run through, uh, I've just run through the facts for Richard Leonard. The operational budget of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service this year has increased. And far from uh, further cuts, as Richard Leonard is asking me about, we have uh, recruited this year, the Fire and Rescue Service have recruited already 100 extra firefighters and are about to, on the 30th of November, uh, open a recruitment campaign for 300 more firefighters. That's increasing frontline firefighters, not reducing the number of frontline firefighters. And as I said, we will ensure that the fire service gets the full benefit of the VAT that they're able to reclaim uh, next year. Now, we will continue to stand up for frontline public services. We will continue to stand up for those who work in our public services. We will continue to stand up for those who work in private companies, just as we did last week, getting a deal together to save BIFAB and the jobs that depend on that. So we will continue to act in the interests of workers, public and private sector workers across Scotland. And as we do so, I hope that we will have the support of Richard Leonard and his colleagues. Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, it's not just the firefighters this government is failing. After seven years of Tory austerity and a decade of mediocrity and indifference from the SNP, we have the result. We have the result of falling wages, shrinking public services, rising poverty, widening inequality, local government budgets decimated. A quarter of a million children in Scotland living in poverty. Hundreds of thousands of pensioners this winter facing the choice between eating and heating. More of the same, more of the same just won't do. Scotland needs real change and radical change. So will the First Minister stand up? Stand up for Scotland's firefighters. Stand up for Scotland's public services workers. Stand up for all of Scotland's people. And finally, use the powers of the Parliament to stop the cuts. First Minister. Well, in that, in that rather, rather rambling question, I think I heard Richard Leonard mention pensions. Uh, can I remind Richard Leonard that pensions are a reserved matter? However, if he wants to join us in a campaign to devolve responsibility for pensions to this Parliament, I would be delighted. Secondly, I have, I have, we have, and we will continue to oppose austerity. Uh, but I simply remind Richard Leonard that the current, the current period of austerity was actually started by Gordon Brown and Alistair Darling under the last Labour government. Richard Leonard also mentioned wages, and I say again, this government, unlike any other government in the UK, has committed to lifting the 1% public sector pay cap, uh, and that will form part of the budget that we present to this parliament in just a couple of weeks' time. And can I uh, suggest to Richard Leonard 
that it is easy for Labour, out of power, to call on those in government to do things, but that's not credible when the only part of the UK where Labour is in power, they refuse to do the things that Labour in this Parliament call on us to do. So perhaps the next time Richard Leonard, or before the next time Richard Leonard wants to come and ask me to do these things, he should persuade the First Minister of Wales, the Labour First Minister of Wales, to do them uh, as well. So we will, when we put forward our budget, it will be a budget to protect public services, it will be a budget to protect the low income, vulnerable people of our country, and it will be a budget overall that is about standing up for Scotland and when we publish it I will challenge all parties across this chamber to back it because it will be in the interest of the country we serve. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I uh, add my congratulations to Richard Leonard on his election and welcome him to his place on the Labour front bench. One of the most short-sighted mistakes in the UK budget is the decision to cut stamp duty, which all serious analysis shows will push house prices even higher and entirely fail to benefit first-time buyers. Their methods of investment in new housing is also likely to provide more benefit for developers and landowners than for people truly in need of genuinely affordable housing. Now, the equivalent of stamp duty is devolved in Scotland, and the Scottish Government has previously already given ground to pressure from the Tories by cutting it to compete with George Osborne's policy. Can the First Minister give a clear guarantee that the Scottish Government will not repeat that mistake and will this time refuse to follow a foolish decision by a UK Government? First Minister. Well, of course, we've already got a more progressive system of uh, what is stamp duty south of the border, what is land and buildings transaction tax here in Scotland. Now, the, the Treasury uh, said yesterday that the policy that was announced in the budget was intended to exempt 80% of first-time buyers from stamp duty. Uh, let me just run through the current position in Scotland. Uh, already in Scotland, 65% of first-time buyers are completely exempt from LBTT. 80% of first-time buyers already pay either no tax at all or less than £600 in LBTT and all first-time buyers, 100%, uh, who buy at or below the average Scottish house price are already exempt from paying LBTT. So we already provide much more generous support to first-time buyers. Of course, uh, as we finalise our budget uh, over the next couple of weeks, we will consider whether or not it is appropriate to give any further assistance uh, to uh, first-time buyers. I, I think as we do that, two points uh, will be very much in our consideration. Firstly, uh, the fact that house prices are lower in Scotland than they are in the rest of the UK. So, for example, the equivalent of a house at £300,000 in the rest of the UK in Scotland would be around £175,000. And secondly, we, of course, will be very mindful of the point Patrick Harvey uh, talks about today. The OBR, uh, Office for Budget Responsibility, said yesterday that in its view, uh, the policy announced by the Chancellor will push up house prices and result in first-time buyers actually paying more for their house than they would without that policy. So even with the kind of voodoo economics that we get from the Tories, I don't think that would make much sense. So these will be the considerations that we have in mind as we finalise our own budget proposals in a couple of weeks' time. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. I, I agree that it wouldn't make much sense. It didn't make much sense last time the Scottish Government did it either, because throwing tax cuts into a dysfunctional housing market solves nothing. But of course, housing isn't the only area where the UK government is determined to help those least in need. Yet another income tax cut for high earners, while people working hard to deliver public services have still not been given a fair pay rise. Now, if the SNP's Westminster leader meant what he said yesterday in the Westminster chamber, that public sector pay should match the cost of living, a phrase I don't think we've heard from the First Minister yet, if we're to see that and if we're also to avoid handing on Tory cuts to our local services and other parts of the Scottish budget, isn't it time for the First Minister to come off the fence on income tax and accept that we need a radical redesign along the lines that the Green Party has proposed, protecting low earners, cutting inequality and raising revenue from the likes of the First Minister and myself who can afford to pay more to invest in the services that our country needs? 
First well, Minister. I think in terms of the, the Green Party's specific proposals that they put forward at the election, when you read the detail of the paper we published uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, what would be raised from those would, would certainly give you pause for thought about whether actually that was uh, the right way uh, to go. But we have set out options around income tax that will uh, allow us, uh, if we choose to follow any of the options, to see tax revenue uh, make a contribution uh, to meeting the challenges that we face in terms of our budget. In terms of public sector pay, I've been very clear that the 1% pay cap should be lifted and that we have to have pay settlements for those in our public uh, sector that of course are affordable. That is just uh, a statement of fact, but also reflect the real life living circumstances of public uh, sector workers. Now, I know everybody uh, across the chamber, understandably, no doubt those in the, the press gallery also uh, want me to hear me say today specifically what our proposals in tax and public sector pay will be uh, when we produce our budget. But we will go through uh, the, the perhaps uh, less dramatic but certainly more appropriate process of finalising our budget proposals and presenting them to this parliament in just uh, a couple of weeks' time. Uh, and then everybody will be able to debate them and I hope support them because the proposals we put forward will be in the overall interest of this country, its people, its public services and its economy. We have a number of supplementaries. The first from Mary Gujo. The First Minister will no doubt have heard the news today that Dundee's bid to become the European capital of culture in 2023 has been dealt a fatal blow because, according to reports, the UK will now no longer be able to host this because of Brexit. Now, Dundee's bid had the potential to have a massive positive impact, not just for Dundee, but for the likes of my constituency in Angus North and Mearns and the wider North East. So can I ask the First Minister what conversations she has had ha and the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government on this matter? First Minister. Well, can I thank Mary Gujon for raising this issue. I'm absolutely dismayed uh, by the news that I've heard this morning from the European Commission uh, that Dundee's uh, European Capital of Culture uh, bid looks as if it is going to be the latest victim of the Tories' obsession with taking this country out of the European Union against our will, and they should hang their heads in shame. Uh, the, the Scottish Government, uh, of course, uh, anticipated uh, these issues. Uh, late last year, Fiona Hislop wrote to the UK Government to highlight the enormous benefits that international cultural engagement can bring and to seek reassurances then that the UK would continue to participate in partnerships like the European Capital of Culture. So it is now deeply concerning that the amount of time, effort and expense that Dundee have put into scoping out their bids could be wasted thanks to the Brexit policy of this Tory government. So we are uh, now in urgent contact with the UK government and uh, Dundee to understand the potential implications of this situation and to establish what action the UK government is going to take to address it. And let me uh, leave the chamber in no doubt. I call on the UK government today to make clear uh, not just why this has happened, but how they intend to fix it so that Dundee can continue to aspire to be the European capital of culture that it so richly deserves to be. Yeah. <laughs> Jeremy Balfour. <clears throat> uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, would the First Minister join with me in expressing concern that Dad's Rock, a charity based here in Lothian and well known to the Scottish Government for the good work it does helping dads develop better relationships with their children, is having to reduce services including playgroups, counselling, following re recent funding cuts. Would she um, ask her officials to meet with me and with Dad's Rock to see what help can be given in the short term and long term to support this worthy cause? First Minister. Well, uh, firstly, can I thank Jeremy Balfour for raising uh, the issue of Dad's Rock. It is a, uh, an organisation that I uh, know of and have seen firsthand the excellent work that it does to help fathers develop uh, better relationships with their children, something that for the good of society overall is a very, very uh, worthwhile cause. Um, I will have my officials uh, look into the particular issue that Jeremy Balfour raises and, and write to him once we've had the opportunity to do that. Um, the final point I would make, and it's not intended to have a go at Jeremy Balfour, he's raising legitimately a, an important constituency issue, but here we see one of just many real life implications of what I was saying to Ruth Davidson earlier on. Yeah. We face next year a £200 million real terms cut in our day-to-day -day budget. 
and these are the kind of implications that will have to be faced because of that. So that, I'm afraid, I'm afraid is bringing the Tories face to face with the real consequences of the budget decisions that they make. And Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. Can I remind the Chamber that I'm a board member of Rem Remembering Srebrenica Scotland and also PLO to the First Minister. Yesterday, former Bosnian Serb commander Ratko Mladic was jailed for life for atrocities committed in the 1990s Bosnian War, including the 1995 genocide at Srebrenica, in which over 8,000 mainly Muslim men and boys were slaughtered. This result will be of interest to many in Scotland, particularly those in our Bosnian community. Does the First Minister agree that yesterday's verdict is a tribute, not just to the importance of the international community working together, but particularly for groups like the Mothers of Srebrenica, who have campaigned tirelessly on behalf of the victims? And will the First Minister commit to helping in any way Scotland can to delivering a stable and prosperous future for our friends in Bosnia-Herzegovina? I share, share very much uh, Gail Ross's sentiments. I uh, very much welcome yesterday's verdict and the sentence handed down to uh, Radko Mladic. Uh, you know, I personally, as I know others in this chamber have, have visited Srebrenica, visited the memorial at Potokari, and uh, I know uh, from the people I met there how much this verdict and sentence will mean uh, to them and indeed to all uh, who suffered in the 1995 uh, genocide and indeed to everybody across uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina uh, who has suffered as a result uh, of genocide and war. Uh, we need to ensure that the victims of violence and uh, also and perhaps in particular victims of sexual violence are heard and that the crimes against them are not forgotten. Uh, groups like the Mothers of Srebrenica, who I've also had the privilege of meeting, provide an inspiration for all of us, governments and communities right across the world, to act to reduce and ultimately eradicate violence against women. Uh, so I, I know today it would be appropriate for all of us uh, in this uh, parliament, on behalf of the people of Scotland, to send a message of commemoration, solidarity and support to the people of Srebrenica. Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, the independent Fraser of Allender Institute passed its verdict on the UK government budget, and it branded UK growth prospects as, and I quote, dire. As the MSP for a rural part of Scotland that will feel the impact first, and as PLO to the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, does the First Minister agree with me that the case for continued single market membership is growing stronger by the day? First Minister. Yeah, yes, I do. Um, I think the case for remaining within the European Union possibly goes, grows stronger by the day, but certainly, as a minimum, remaining within the single market and the customs union, we're starting to see on an almost daily basis the consequences of Brexit from uh, the confirmation earlier this week that the European Medicines Agency and the European Banking Agency are to leave London for other European capitals to the news today about Dundee's uh, capital of culture bid uh, to some very real financial consequences. Uh, you know, it was striking yesterday in the budget that the Chancellor set aside more money uh, to deal with the consequences of a Tory hard Brexit than he set aside to help the NHS yeah. with the pressures yeah. they face. That says everything you need to know yeah. about the warp priorities of the Tory government at Westminster. Uh, and I think as every day passes and as these consequences uh, become more stark, that case for making sure that our country is not ripped out of the European single market will get ever more strong. Yeah. Question number four, Ash Denham to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the autumn budget. First Minister. Uh, yesterday's budget provided few measures to grow the economy, tackle inequality or invest in public services. The announcements in relation to the North Sea and ending the VAT obligation on police and fire services are certainly welcome, albeit long overdue. However, our block grant for day-to-day -day public spending, as I've already said, is being cut by over £200 million in real terms next year and by 2019-20, our discretionary budget will have been reduced by £2.6 billion in real terms over the decade. Uh, while the budget provides uh, some consequentials, over half of these are financial transactions, which the Scottish Government 
cannot spend on frontline public services and which then have to be repaid to the Treasury. So overall, this budget contained little to help Scottish households, businesses or public services. Ashton. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but note the real terms cut to Scotland's revenue, which is a real disappointment. Yesterday, revised OBR growth figures underline the fact that Tory austerity is failing. And on top of that, average wages are set to fall and taxpayers will pay through the nose for Brexit. When Scotland badly needs growth in our economy, isn't it time for real investment with no strings attached and more powers for this parliament to grow our economy? First Minister. Yes, I agree that the more power we have in this parliament to take our own decisions, the better it will be for people the length and breadth of our country. Uh, the Resolution Foundation is reporting this morning, and this is a serious point that I know the Tories won't want to listen to, but they really should listen to it. Uh, the Resolution Foundation this morning says that average pay will not return to its pre-crisis level until 2025. That is 17 years after the pay squeeze began. Uh, and of course, in the budget yesterday, there was not one single extra penny confirmed uh, to help lift public sector pay. So that, I think, is the priority we see the Westminster government attach to the living standards of people across our country. So we will use next month's budget to put forward an alternative approach which allows us to invest in our public services, but also allows us to protect those on the lowest incomes uh, in Scotland uh, from the impact of the Tory cuts that are biting so hard. Murdo Fraser. Thank you. The Chancellor announced yesterday that Scottish police and fire services can now reclaim VAT thanks to pressure from 13 Scottish Conservative MPs at Westminster. But will the First Minister now accept that this was a mess entirely of the Order, SNP's please. own making, that they went into the police and fire services mergers with their eyes fully open, fully aware of the consequences of their actions. And so would you now like to take the opportunity to Order, thank please. a Conservative Chancellor for clearing up the SNP's mess for them? First Minister. President Officer, I increasingly just love it when Myrtle Fraser gets to his feet. <laughs> it's like Christmas come early every week. Let me remind the chamber what one Murdo Fraser, I'm assuming it's the same one we've just heard from there, <laughs> said about a police and fire VAT refund, not eons ago, but just a matter of weeks ago, on the 31st of October 2017, Murdo Fraser got to his feet in this chamber and said, there is no justification for a VAT refund for police <laughs> and fire. I think it was really, really, really cruel of his Tory colleagues at Westminster to prove him so completely and utterly wrong. <laughs> but then he is often completely and utterly wrong. You know, yesterday the Tories were forced to concede that they've been wrong all along on this issue. And you know, see, see this argument, this argument that it's all because the SNP pursued a policy of a single police force. You know the flaw in that argument for the Tories? The Tories proposed a single police force as well. So this argument that it's all a mess caused by SNP policy kind of falls apart when the Tories had exactly the same policy all along. The fact is, the Tories knew they were in the wrong, in an indefensible position, but by refusing to do the right thing until they somehow thought they could wring some party political advantage out of it just shows how small-minded and partisan the Tories are, and it reflects really badly on them. But my final point, presiding officer, is this. Having conceded that it is wrong to take VAT out of the pockets of our emergency services, it's not enough just to fix it for the future. Let's have the £140 million that's been nicked from our emergency services back. James Kelly. Thank you. The First Minister will be aware of the publication of a report from COSLA last week demonstrating how the SSNP government have systematically penalised local government, resulting in £1.5 billion of cuts and 15,000 job losses. But it's not just the figures, it's the impact on local communities. The day centres closed and the libraries that have disappeared from local areas. 
The First Minister has fudged taxation all the way through this session. When will she finally show some leadership and produce a budget, pr produce a budget which will use the powers of the Parliament, deliver progressive taxation and give a fair funding to local government in order that we can protect local jobs and local services? First Minister. Well, James Kelly asked me when we will set out our position on tax uh, and all the other matters. The answer to that question, which I think he knows, is the 14th of December, yeah. when we publish our budget in this chamber. And, you know, uh, he talks about local government funding, very important, a very important aspect of our budget considerations. We, uh, in the budget for this financial year, took steps to protect the spending power of local government. In fact, we increased the spending power of local government consider considerably, and we will continue to do everything we can to protect frontline services. But, you know, I say again what I've said previously to Labour members who stand up in this chamber and raise the issue of local government budgets, because we also last year uh, gave local councils the option of increasing their council tax up to a maximum of 3% to help with these pressures. And the only councils across Scotland who thought they had enough money so they didn't have to do that were Labour councils. So we have Labour standing up in here calling for more money, but their own councils ignore them by refusing to use the options that they've got to raise more money. It seems that Labour councils listen to James Kelly just as closely as Kezia Dugdale did when he told her she wasn't allowed to go to the jungle. Question number five, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recently published internal staff survey from the Scottish Ambulance Service, which suggests that work pressure had affected the health of more than half of the respondents. First Minister. The Scottish Ambulance Service staff, uh, who responded to over 740,000 incidents last year, provide an exceptional service across Scotland, often in the most difficult of circumstances. Yesterday, the Health Secretary met with the Chief Executive of the Scottish Ambulance Service to set out our expectations for the support uh, for the health and well-being of staff. Uh, Pauline Howey, who is the Chief Executive of the Ambulance Service, and her senior team are considering the findings of this survey in detail, and they are clear that they will be taking additional steps to address the issues raised. Alexander Stewart. I thank the First Minister for that response. But back in June 2008, when you were the Health Secretary, you gave the Scottish Ambulance Service one month to bring forward plans to end single staffing of its emergency ambulances, and said at that time, I quote, take action to eliminate rostered single manning. Yet a Freedom of Information request shows that last year it occurred over 2,200 times. What reassurances can the First Minister give to staff on the front line that this will continue and that they will not be put in this intolerable position? First Minister. Well, of course, single crewing of ambulances should happen only in exceptional circumstances, and we will continue to monitor that closely uh, with the Scottish Ambulance Service. If you look at the figures for uh, the most recent quarter, April to June 20. 17, uh, the number of single crewed shifts increased slightly by 28 shifts from the previous quarter, uh, but it remained 1.3% uh, of the total shifts carried out over uh, that period. And we will continue to work closely with the ambulance service to ensure that uh, that only happens genuinely in exceptional circumstances. Uh, we're currently, of course, committed to supporting the service to train a thousand additional paramedics over this parliament to further help reduce pressure on A&E and to support primary care transformation. Um, and that work is underway. Uh, the, uh, those who work in our ambulance service, as I said, do an exceptional job. And I think we all recognise that it is one of the most challenging jobs that anybody uh, could do. The Scottish Ambulance Service have an employee assistance programme which includes counselling for staff who witness traumatic events, uh, therapeutic services and fast track access to physiotherapy for example but as part of their consideration of this survey uh, the Scottish Ambulance Service will be considering what further steps they need to take to give the appropriate support to those who work for them. Question number six, Ian Gray. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government plans to take to support students in light of the call in the report, a new social contract for students, for them to be given a minimum income entitlement of £8,100 per year. First Minister. 
The government is committed to ensuring that all students, especially those in our most deprived communities, are provided with the financial support they need to succeed. Uh, that, indeed, is why we commissioned the independent review of student support, and I want to take this opportunity to thank Jane Angaria and the members of the review board for all their hard work on this over the past year. The report sets out a number of recommendations that would fundamentally change the way students are supported, so it is only right that we now take some time to consider these recommendations in detail uh, and, of course, as part of current and future budget processes, and we will set out our next steps in due course. Ian Gray. The key question for the government's response is, of course, the balance they strike between grants and loans. The review's central recommendation is disappointing in that it would embed the cuts to grants for university students, which this government made in 2013, and would yet again increase student indebtedness. Those debt levels have already doubled under this government, in spite of their promise to dump the debt, right. with poorest students coming out with the highest debt. Will the First Minister now listen to NUS Scotland and shift the balance of student support back towards higher grants, rather than just more debt? First Minister. Well, um, let me start by saying, uh, on a point of consensus, I, I do think Ian Gray is right that that is perhaps not the only key point, but one of the key points uh, relevant to the government's response to this report. And as I said, we will respond in due course after carefully considering the recommendations. Um, I should say, though, that while I don't uh, negate the point Ian Gray is making about the importance of that point, uh, we do see a situation now where total student support uh, is up. Uh, we see average student support uh, per student now up more full-time higher education students than ever are receiving uh, support. Uh, almost 3,000 additional students qualified for a non-repayable bursary or saw their funding increase last year and that is a result of the decision we've already taken to raise the income threshold uh, for uh, bursaries uh, and we've paid out more in grants and bursaries uh, last year than in the previous year. Uh, so that is the record uh, that we've got. We want now to look at how we build on that. But the, the final point I would make is this, while understanding absolutely uh, the issues raised uh, by student debt, and indeed that's one of the issues why we are so determined to keep uh, tuition fees out uh, of Scotland, but we have a situation where average uh, student loan debt in Scotland is significantly lower than it is in any other part of the UK. In England, average student loan debt is £32,220. In Scotland, is at £11,740. So we have work to do, and this report provides us with the basis to do that work. Uh, but it is also important to recognise that in many respects, students in Scotland get much greater support than they do elsewhere in the UK. Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Can the First Minister outline how the Scottish Government will take forward its commitment to raise the student loan repayment threshold and reduce the payment term? First Minister. Well, we are actively considering how to take that forward now. That was a manifesto commitment that we made at the last election. It's something we had already uh, committed to even before the report uh, that was published this week. So we will shortly set out uh, the detail of how we take forward that particular commitment. Question number seven, Neil Findlay. Uh, can I declare an interest in both my wife and daughter work at St John's Hospital? Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to concerns that any waiting times at St John's Hospital have been misrepresented. First Minister. Well, I think the concern of the Government uh, is reflected in the action that the Health Secretary has taken. Uh, last week, she ordered an independent review into concerns around waiting times, practices and staff pressure at St John's Hospital Emergency Department. That followed instructions that the Health Secretary gave to NHS Lothian to examine these claims, uh, claims that had been raised with her by a whistleblower. Uh, this uh, confirmed certain areas of concern and as a result she asked the Scottish Academy of Medical Royal Colleges to undertake an external review to investigate uh, and that review will report back to the Health Secretary early in the new year. Neil Findlay. This week the Health and Sport Committee heard from representatives of a &E staff, from doctors, allied health professionals and nurses about how staff shortages and cuts are impacting on staff morale, the culture across the NHS and ultimately patient care. At St John's, I hear repeatedly from staff who desperately want to do their job well, but who are un unable to do so because there aren't enough of them. And these re latest revelations about the misreporting of waiting times appear to be yet more evidence of that. So in the forthcoming budget, will the First Minister ensure that the NHS is fully funded, it is staffed appropriately and safely, 
and that those who care for us are paid a fair wage for their efforts. First Minister. Well, I would uh, agree with uh, Neil Finlay's comments about the importance of the work that those working in our NHS generally, but perhaps particularly those working in our emergency departments do. Um, I recognise, I, I readily recognise, uh, both as a former Health Secretary, as First Minister now, but just as a citizen uh, of this country, uh, the pressure that those working in our health service are under. Uh, it has always been a job that has uh, meant people working under pressure, but with the ageing population, we know that those pressures are increasing. That is why we have increased increased uh, the budget of the Frontline Health Service, uh, an additional £3 billion over the life of this government so far. It's why we had uh, the most extensive commitment at the election last year to additional funding in the NHS uh, of any party over the lifetime of this parliament. We see uh, additional people working within our health service, of course, as well as additional funding. We need to see continued reform of how health services work and how they work in conjunction with social care services. So we will continue in the budget that will come forward in a couple of weeks' time and beyond uh, to take the best possible decisions to make sure that our health service has the support it needs. Thank you. And that concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, lead um, the Chamber of the Public, but can I just clarify that Dad's Watch's uh, funding cut came from third party organisations, not from national government, either here or at Westminster? Thank you for that clarification. I'm not sure it's a point of order, but thank you. Uh, that concludes First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business in the name of Ivan McKee. Uh, on the day of the imprisoned writer. We'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats.